Okay, so next let's turn to page 53 and talk about the NLP communication model in a bit more detail. So if you look on page 53, what this shows us is that there's some external event, whatever that event might be. So again, we'll use the example of winning the lottery or first kiss or the recession or whatever the event might be. And what happens is we get bombarded by this information everything that happens on around you so you know you've got physical events that you know we might take notice of in the example that i've just given there winning lottery first kiss or recession but you've also got other things that is happening other information that's coming into you and this information comes in through our five senses now they say that we're bombarded by around 11 million bits of information. So where's all that information come from? Well, it can be the sound of your computer fan. Or until I mentioned it, maybe you weren't aware of the feeling of the chair under your bum. Or if you're laying down, the feeling on your back. Or maybe you weren't aware of the heat or a breeze, or the sound of the air conditioner, or the feeling of your feet as they're touching the floor. Whatever, there is so much information. However, we can't consciously pay attention to all of it. In fact, I think if we try to, we'll probably each get one of those nice little white coats that they tie quite tightly so that you can hug yourself. You know, I think you'll go crazy uh, if you try to consciously pay attention to everything. And so as we have this 11 million bits of information that come in at us, we actually delete, generalize, and distort. So our little man there on page 53 shows that we've got some filters. And these filters are time, space, matter, energy, our language, our memories, our decisions, our values and our beliefs and our attitudes. And of course, these are different for each one of us. And so as this information comes into us, we delete, generalize, and distort that information as it runs through our internal filters. And so, of course, if each of these filters are different for us and we delete, generalize, and distort differently, by the time I take in my 134 bits of information out of that 11 million, of course, that can be a different 134 bits of information that you might take out of the same 11 million. And that's why we said that when we create this internal representation, and that internal representation is made up of pretty much your thoughts or the things that you're doing inside of your head, those six things, which is on the left-hand side of your page, pictures, sounds, feelings, tastes, smell and self-talk so ad auditory digital stands for self-talk so as that information comes into us then we delete generalize and distort and we take in our own 134 bits of information and we create our internal representation those six things that can be different so you might have two people let's say you had two people standing next to the ocean and they were looking across out onto the ocean. Those two people, the exact same time, standing next to each other, looking across the exact same ocean, can have two totally different experiences. As an example, I love to dive. And I could imagine, wow, what a beautiful day. The sea is so calm. Look at the glistening sunlight, you know, reflecting off the ocean. And I can't wait to get into the ocean to go catch some crayfish and, and spearfish. However, somebody else looking at the exact same sea. In fact, I had a friend who was on a ship that sank. Luckily, of course, uh, she survived. But now that lady, let's say it was her looking across the ocean, can be absolutely terrified of going in the ocean because of that experience that she had had. So it's the exact same ocean. Nothing has changed. The only thing that's different is the 
internal representation, the thing that we're focusing on, what is it that that external event, that information that's happening outside of her there, how is she taking that in? What's she deleting, generalizing, and distorting to create this internal representation? And of course, now I have a totally different external behavior to what I have. I want to go out diving, and of course, she wants to get further up the beach, maybe in the car, and drive away as fast as possible. So the events can be the exact same, but we can interpret them differently, which means that what we experience is not really reality. By the time you become aware of what you're experiencing, it's already been filtered. You've already run it through your own filters and deleted, generalized and distorted. And that's your reality. That's what you are experiencing. So what are these things we're doing? What, what do we do when we delete? Well, we can't consciously pay attention to everything. So in every situation, there's more going on than what you realize. Have you ever driven down the road and, you know, somebody, you, you've driven this road for years and somebody says to you, oh, you know what, I went to this shop which is on the road. And you say, w -w where's that shop? I've been driving that road for years. And then suddenly you notice she has the shop and you never noticed it before. Or you notice a new building has gone up. Now they've been building it for months. But you didn't realize it. You weren't paying attention to it because it wasn't that important. Similar to you not paying attention to how your bum feels on the seat. If it's not important, it's not important. Next, we distort. And when we distort, we attribute meanings to events based on our existing map. So we can make misrepresentations of reality. It's like seeing a rope or a stick and thinking it's a snake. That's a distortion. In fact, psychologists have identified various different types of distortions, like confirmation bias. So we pay more attention to evidence that supports our beliefs and downplay or ignore evidence that doesn't. Or the bandwagon effect. We're more likely to do or believe something when we see other people doing or believing it. Or the illusion of control. We believe we can control or influence outcomes even when we can't. And then there's also the halo effect. And so if we like one quality or trait about a person or thing, then we tend to view the other qualities or traits more favorably as well. These are just some examples of distortions. What about generalizations? They form a great basis for learning. If you happen to burn your hand on a hot plate or a stove, you don't have to go and put your hand on every hot plate or stove to find out if it will burn again. You've done it once and now you know how to do it. Or now you know that it will be burning. Think of opening a door. You learned from a young age that you turn the knob or you pull down the door handle. So whenever you walk up to a new door, you know that you turn the handle or you push the, push the handle down or turn the knob and you pull or push the door to open it. You see, thinking often is time consuming and it can be expensive in energy. So if we had to think about every single thing that we did as we went through our daily life, you know, all the way from the first principle to actually acting and doing it, it will probably drive us crazy. By doing generalizations, it can actually work against us as well. So we can take information and misinterpret it. Or we can jump to conclusions about people. Because we might look through this lens of prejudice. And so, you know, sometimes people can have misrepresentations. Example, somebody maybe doesn't perform sexually once. And then he might think that he's a sexual failure. So these generalizations, they can work for, to our advantage and also disadvantage. So once we take in this information, we group it in seven plus or minus two pieces of information. And so psychologist George Miller said, he said, we can't consciously pay attention to more than seven plus or minus two chunks of information. 
So we can actually take this information, we can chunk it as well. So example, a phone number. Look at your cell phone numbers. They still pretty much, for the most part, up to about nine characters. If you took a long number, so you had to include a country code, an area code, and the phone number, then what you could do is you could chunk the country code as one piece of information. And you could put the area code as another piece of information. So you can take more numbers or more information and then just chunk it into little groups. But typically, we're looking at seven plus or minus two bits of information or two pieces of information, should I say, rather. So now we've got this internal representation. So the internal representation is made up of pictures, sounds, feelings, tastes, smells, and self-talk. And these things are our focus. These things are the things that we are focusing on. And it's coupled with our state and coupled with our physiology. Now state is what type of state are you in? A happy state, a sad state, loving state. Your physiology, what are you doing with your body? What are you doing? Are you eating well? Are you sleeping well? Are you exercising well? How do you carry yourself? If you've ever watched Winnie the Pooh and you see Eeyore and Tigger asks him, how are you doing? And he says, I'm fine. But his body is this real slouchy, almost not interested kind of movement. And of course, so that physiology in that case actually is not congruent with what he's saying. So these three things, our internal representation, our state and our physiology are intertwined. And they can actually affect one another as well. And when we take those three things, we then have an external behavior. So we behave externally in regards to whatever the event was. Now, of course, this event and behavior could both happen inside our heads as well. But I could uh, have the first kiss as an example. And, you know, the behavior might be either I'm dancing outside and in the rain because I'm so happy. Or, you know what, I might be crying because I made a big, big mistake, you know, and uh, that was not the girl I wanted to kiss. Or people that go, go into the recession. Why is it that some people become wealthy and other people, well, they go broke? We have some behavior that is happening. Now, if I can change the internal representation or the state or the physiology, then I can change the external behavior. And that's a wonderful thing to bear in mind. Now, we're going to look a lot at changing the internal representation uh, as well as the state. But let me give you an example of physiology. If it's safe to do so, why don't you go ahead and take your arms, spread your arms out, and lay flat over your lap so that you're laying over your knees, sit down, lay over your knees, arms hanging down to the ground, breathe out, and get that narfi feeling. If you're ever in the army, narfi means not at all freaking interested. And so you get that narfi feeling, and say in this sort of tonality, I feel awesome. And experience that for yourself. Do you actually feel awesome? Well, probably not. Now, shake that off. Sit up straight or stand up straight. Take your arms, stretch them out like in the winner's pose. You know when the, you got your arms across the top of your, stretched out almost like a starfish. And say, I feel awesome. And notice the difference. How that shift in physiology makes a difference. So this is our NLP communication model. And we said then that these things, this internal representation, pictures, sounds, feelings, tastes, and self-talk, 
have an impact on our external behavior. And that internal representation is what we are focusing on. And so we want to take that focus and focus on what we want, not what you don't want. So we have these 90,000 thoughts a day. And around 80-85% of them so are reoccurring thoughts. And most of them are negative thoughts for many people. So what is the sum total? Just like your physiology when you laid over your lap saying, oh, I feel awesome. That had a probably not such a great impact on your mood and your experience. So what is the sum total of 90,000 thoughts per day over the years that you've been alive? If this mind-body connection where our thinking influences our neurology and our body, what is the sum total of all the thoughts that you've had up until now? And so we change these, this focus to what it is we want. Remember that we want to strive for excellence. There's no such thing as perfection because something can always get better. But we want to strive for excellence. The pursuit of perfection for many people just leads to analysis paralysis and they don't actually ever get started. It's better to start with something and improve it than not to start at all. Take your focus, focus on what it is that you want, the resources that you have available and move towards the outcome that you want. So that internal representation is our experience. And so that experience, we said then, is a subjective experience. Because by the time you're aware of that experience, it's already been deleted, generalized, and distorted. And so that's the NLP communication model and our internal representations. And that says a lot then for perceptions projection, that you can only perceive something outside of you which is already inside of you. Now, as we go through the training, I'd like you to think of every technique that we learn, every tool, every technique, simply as a Lego block. And in itself, it's just a block. You know, my two daughters, they love building Lego blocks. And as we throw all the blocks out on the floor, they might say, Daddy, let's build a spaceship. And then we will use certain blocks. Not all of them, because they don't all fit with the spaceship. And then if they say, Daddy, let's build a motorboat, then we might use some different Lego blocks. And so every technique that we're going to learn, think of it purely as just a Lego block. And so as we work with our client, we will be using different Lego blocks based on what the client's requirements are and the problem is that the client is facing and the outcome that the client wants. And we will use whatever techniques and tools we need to help the client get to that outcome. And so we will then pick, as we would pick different Lego blocks, we would pick the different techniques and tools right for that particular client. When we get closer to the end of the training, we will see, and I will give you an example of what it looks like from when a client comes in to see you to leaving. So what are some of the things and how do we put those Lego blocks together? How do we put those techniques and tools together to help the client get to the outcome? So we'll have a look at that later on in the training.